The heart of my home is the kitchen. And at this time of the year, it's the perfect place to gather and celebrate the festive season. <laughs> For me, Christmas is all about rustling up some fantastic food and eating it in the company of my favourite people. These are the dishes that I cook when I want to spread a little bit of cheer. These are my Christmas home comforts. I love spending winter days working in my veg patch because there's no doubt you can make the tastiest and most Christmassy dishes with ingredients that are bang in season. So I'm going to show you how to use the best of what's on offer over the festive period. Today I'm tucking into a Christmas delicacy that'll leave your taste buds tingling. This is really the jewel in the crown at this time of the year. Rustling up a hearty winter warmer. That is one cracking bowl of soup. And converting my gardening friend, Charlie Dimmock, to my style of cooking. It needs something. What does it need? You're going to say butter, aren't you? Exactly right. <laughs> Charlie, you're exactly right there. <laughs> to start, let's do something traditional. That great Christmas custom of sticking a bird in the oven. But this roast dinner comes with a twist or two. Now, there's plenty of seasonal produce to choose from around this time of the year. But one I particularly love are cranberries. Now, you can get them, obviously, fresh or dry. Now, I'm going to use them in two different ways, one of which as a nice little sauce and the other one as a garnish with a cabbage. But it's all based around duck and potatoes. And I've got a wonderful bit of duck here, and I'm going to cook it very, very simply with a classic dish called boulangere potatoes. This is a hearty seasonal dish for up to six people. You'll need to thinly slice about a kilo and a half of spuds, along with two good-sized onions. I like to do this job on a mandolin, but you have to take care using one. Now, the word boulanger comes from baker's oven in French, because traditionally the baker would cook the bread in the morning in the wood-fired oven, and then everybody in the village would basically just cook potatoes with onions and a little bit of water or stock that they had left over and finish it off in the baker's oven. To recreate this rustic classic, I layer the potato and onion slices in a large dish with lots of seasoning and half a litre of chicken stock. Then I pop it on the bottom shelf of an oven that's been preheated to 180 degrees Celsius. I've got a wonderful duck here. Now what I'm going to do is to pair this. It's really simple. All you do is grab yourself a fork, take your anger out on the duck by whacking it all over the top. What you're doing is create little pockets so the fat can drip out. You probably want to do this dish the day after Christmas Day. And then I'm going to stuff the duck, not with a, a traditional stuffing. All it's going to have is a little satsuma and a cinnamon stick just placed inside. And then just sprinkle the top with some Chinese five spice. Just rub it over the top. You don't need too much of the spice. About half a teaspoon should do the trick. But you will need plenty of seasoning. And then this is the interesting bit. We take the entire lot, don't cook it on a tray, sit it directly above the potatoes. You want all that fat to drip on the potatoes to flavour them from the duck. Now put a tray underneath to catch the excess fat and then every now and then you can take the tray and just pour it onto the potatoes as well. But you leave that in the oven for about an hour and a half to two hours to cook. And with our roast duck and boulanger potatoes, I'm going to serve it with a classic sauce, and one that you would normally do with turkey, and that's cranberry sauce. But instead of just on their own, I'm going to put some of these amazing Bramley apples in it. So now the reason why I like these is they're bang in season at this time of the year, like the cranberries, of course, but they've got a lovely sharpness that go particularly well with duck. When I've peeled and sliced two apples, I add them to the pan with butter along with 200 grams of cranberries and 75 mils of cider. You bring this to the boil and just rapidly cook this now for about eight to 10 minutes. Once the apples have softened, taste the sauce and add caster sugar. Two or three tablespoons should be enough. And then we can season it. The 
bit of salt, a bit of pepper, and that's it. When the sauce is cooked, turn your attention to your final seasonal ingredient, cabbage. And this really is a great veg to serve around Christmas time. So the first thing you do is chop it all up on a decent sized pan. You want about, I say, about a centimetre deep full of water, no more than that, really, for a pan this sort of size. And then you want a good dollop of butter. That's a technical term for about 30 grams. But don't worry if you go a bit over, it is Christmas after all. Black pepper and salt. Now you can see in here, it's starting to basically emulsify into this sauce, which is exactly what you want. And then what we do is take the cabbage and throw it in. Do not take it off the heat. Do not lift the pan, just keep it on the heat. Now, the temptation, really, with this is to add more and more water. What cabbage will do is soak that water and then, all of a sudden, like a sponge, dunk it out onto your plate. Cabbage, funny enough, should be this colour. Green. Not grey. Green. When the cabbage begins to wilt, throw in 50 grams of dried cranberries and cook for another minute. It's an unusual combination, but oh so Christmassy. So, at that point in time, we can then season it with a bit more salt and pepper. And then I'm going to do as the French do. You get a little bit more butter. In. When the cabbage is just about done, get the duck out of the oven and let it rest. Then use the veg as a bed for the meat. And then not forgetting, our potatoes in the oven. The lovely boulanger potatoes. <laughs> and there you have it. An amazing meal for four that's absolutely jam-packed with rich seasonal flavours. By adding cranberries together with the apples, you get a lovely sharpness with it, which works really well with the fattiness with the duck. It's just a great meal to have at this time of the year. It's warming, it's everything you want and full of flavour. I love this. Christmas is a time for indulgence. Well, for me anyway. No sweets for Ralph, though. They're bad for his teeth. I bet he wishes we lived in Austria. Everyone shares in the seasonal spirit there, as our festive food reporter, Annie Gray, has been finding out at the country's famous markets. If there's one thing surer than Santa, it's that these guys really know how to do Christmas. Just look at it here. But to get a flavour of how one Austrian food producer is adding a touch of seasonal extravagance to the festivities, I headed for the hills. A few weeks ago, I visited the beautiful Wachau Valley to unearth one of the festive season's most decadent ingredients, saffron. It's harvested from a particular type of autumn-blooming crocus by saffron lover and botanist Bernhard Carr. They look really pretty. They sort of look like a, almost a bald man's head that's starting to grow. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like getting off on the right foot. And there's something else to put Bernhardt in a bad mood. These hills should be alive with crocuses, but this year's crop is a little late. I can see one. Well, is that one? <laughs> well, that is the only one, or one of the few ones. So what actually is saffron? Well, it is a spice, but we, we, we got it from a flower, which is a crocus, a full-flowering crocus. What we actually take is the red thing here. So the bit that looks like a sort of tongue sticking out of a monster's there's, mouth. <laughs> there, there's three of them, and this is the only aromatic part of the flower, so we only take the red things. And then we dry them, and this is the actual spice. And we need about 200,000 flowers for two pounds of saffron. Good Lord, that's a lot of saffron. Presumably it must mean that it's a really expensive spice. Very much so, that's good for me. <laughs> <laughs> The delicate nature of the flower means saffron has to be collected by hand, making it even pricier. Just two ounces are worth around four and a half thousand pounds. So, ounce for ounce, saffron is more expensive than gold. 
And has this region, the Wachau, always been associated with it? Does it have a long rowing history? It probably started around 1200 and uh, ended in about 1870. Then it was gone for 120, 30 years, and, and I brought it back. It's a bit like saffron Walden in Britain then, which has a long history of growing saffron, but today there's no crocuses left at all. In Tudor England, the town of saffron Walden was the epicentre of British production, although little of the industry remains. So we need someone like you to come back in. That's right, that's right. I'm waiting for Prince Charles' call, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and you're harvesting it between October and November. Does that mean that it's really very much a Christmas seasonal product? It is, yeah, and the yellow colour is nice too. In Austria, saffron is used mainly in desserts and baking. So Bernhardt and I are making a traditional Austrian cake called a Gugelhupf, which is often eaten at Christmas. I've heard that you're a brilliant saffron grower, but aren't quite as good with the cooking of things. No, that's why my wife gave me a recipe, and this tells me how to do it. That is a little recipe. Let's hope making it is a piece of cake. First, I have to grind the saffron in a pestle and mortar, and then add five tablespoons of milk, allowing the saffron to dissolve and release its unique flavour and sunshine yellow colour. Wow, that's a really vibrant colour. That's York yellow. It looks like a York. I certainly haven't cooked with anything like this before. I'm mixing together some icing sugar and butter before adding vanilla sugar. Then I have to beat the mix till it's light and creamy. Right, I think we can probably call that creamed. Very much so. And then um, we put the York inside. So that's three egg yolks and my arm is now going numb. OK, it says beat the egg white together with the salt and the granulated sugar and beat it until it forms stiff peaks. <sighs> you didn't pick a nice, easy, non-physical cake. <laughs> Where's an electric mixer when you need one? <sighs> While I'm panting... <laughs> You're doing fine? <laughs> Tell me... It's why... really entertaining, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it must be hard work holding that little recipe, Bernhardt. Then what? OK. Ah, uh, blah, 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 and mix it with the dough. You can really smell the saffron, can't you? I didn't expect to be able to. That's premium quality, the best we have. Next, I add some flour mixed with baking powder and stir it all together. And now I can put the mixture into the Gugelhupf mould. I want to know what it tastes like. What do you think? My God! Every time I've ever cooked with saffron, it's just tasted like a dead spider fell in the bowl and got kind of mixed yeah. in. <laughs> a bit dusty in the background. I don't even think I can even describe it. It's definitely a spice, isn't it? Almost like paprika and honey mixed, but without the spicy notes or without the cloying notes. It's just a really beautiful, rich flavour. Now we put it in the oven and we're done. Bernhardt's not sticking around for the baking bit. He's off to encourage those reluctant crocuses to bloom, leaving me to enjoy a slice of Google Hupf and one terrific view. It's a really unusual taste. I can't quite put my finger on it. It's, it's absolutely exquisite, but not at all what I was expecting. And what I love most about it is the idea that you plant it in August and you harvest it and it's ready for Christmas. It's like taking a piece of summer sunshine and making it last throughout the cold, cold winter. I always keep some saffron in my house throughout the year. It's perfect for mixing with other seasonal ingredients to make this spicy and hearty winter warmer. Pumpkins are one of my favourite seasonal veg at this time of the year. I'm going to do a classic soup with pumpkin and mussels, and one that takes no time at all. I'm getting the ball rolling by cooking the mussels. First, fry half a chopped onion in butter, then add thyme and a good glug of white wine. And then throw in the mussels, a decent amount of mussels. Now, I don't know why, but whenever I buy saucepans, the first thing I do is throw away the lids. And it's not until a dish like this where you actually realise you need the lids. So just cover it over with tin foil. And we're going to bring this to the boil and cook this quite quickly for about three minutes, just until the mussels start to open. While they bubble away, prep your pumpkin. 
although you can make this with squash. I like to use the nice yellow ones. You can see this beautiful yellow colour. These are bang in season at this time of the year. Fantastic. You can use them for so many different things. I've even made ice cream out of these as well. An acquired taste, I admit, but not quite as Christmassy as this soup. In the couple of minutes it takes to peel your pumpkin, the mussels will be done. Drain them, but keep the cooking liquor for later. Then get back to de-seeding and chopping your pumpkin before frying an onion in a little bit of butter. And then we can add the diced or sliced pumpkin. Now you can keep these seeds, you can use these on salads, mix together with a little egg white and salt and baked in the oven. You get a nice sort of snack that you can have around Christmas time, so don't waste them. Once the pumpkin's in the pan, add two cloves of roughly chopped garlic, 125 mils of white wine, and 400 mils of stock. And then we can take the juice of the mussels. Now, it's important when you do this just to let the pan sit, because so often in mussels you end up with a little bit of grit. Now, if you let the pan sit, that grit will sink to the bottom. So when we tip it out, we leave that grit behind. It's just unpleasant to taste, really. And then I'm going to bring this to the boil and add just a little bit of cream. I like to add double cream for this, but you can add single cream. Well, the diet starts after Christmas. Next, throw in warming winter spices, starting with a perfect complement to your seasonal pumpkin, star anise. Now, count them in because we're going to take them out. We don't want to puree the soup with these in. It becomes far too strong. And then saffron. The redder it is, the deeper red it is, the better quality the saffron generally. But be very, very careful with it. It's very, very strong. This soup should be nice and yellow colour from the pumpkin. Too much of this, it's like a, a spray tan. And as a former Strictly contestant, I have known the trauma of tan. Bring your soup to the boil and simmer for seven to eight minutes until the pumpkin is tender. In that time, you can get the mussels out of their shells. When you've got mussels as good as this, right on your doorstep in the UK, you've got to use them. Make sure you get them nice and fresh. And simply cooked, these can be one of the tastiest things you can ever wish to eat. When the soup is cooked, it's almost ready for the blender. But there's one important job to do first. Now we need to go hunting for our star anise, because one thing you don't want to be doing is blitzing this with these little fellas in. So you just need to find the other one, which is easier said than done. It's in here somewhere. With all the star anise eventually accounted for, I add about two-thirds of the mussels and blend the soup in batches. And the great thing is, you can always freeze what you don't use. Hopefully, what we end up with is a lovely, rich soup. And then you've got to season it. For that, you've just got to keep trying it, which is an added bonus. Salt. When it's got enough seasoning, I add a squeeze of lime juice. And once it goes into my festive serving dish, I throw in a few whole mussels, a splash of cream, and for an extra citrusy kick, a garnish of wood sorrel. Then comes the best bit, tasting. It's warm and it's everything you want for this time of the year. It's got that little bit of spice with the star anise, but most of all, it's great flavour. And you get that from the mussels and the pumpkin predominantly. That is one cracking bowl of soup. One of my favourite Christmas jobs is chopping down my own tree. But I never remember to rope in someone to help me carry it to the car. A bad back is not going to stop me enjoying the festive season, though. But food historian Ivan Day has been finding out that our ancestors didn't have half as much fun in the lead-up to the big day. We associate Christmas with feasting, but before the 16th century, it was preceded by a month of deprivation during the Advent fast, when all meat was forbidden until Christmas Day. 
Fish and seafood were an important element in any meal in the lead up to Christmas. Advent fasting went out with the Reformation in 16th century Britain, but the custom of eating seafood on Christmas Eve continued for many years afterwards. So new recipes were always in demand. If I was a cook in 1758 looking for ideas, I might turn to this book by John Thacker, The Art of Cookery. In it, I found a very interesting recipe for oysters in a red wine spiced jelly. Sounds a bit Christmassy because it does remind me a little bit of seafood in Glühwein. Now, I've seen Ivan cook a few unusual dishes, but oysters in jelly, he's outdone himself. He starts with calves foot jelly, which is the setting agent. He then adds red wine, spiced peppercorns, mace and lemon juice. And finally, these little cochineal beetles, which will make the jelly a bright Christmas red. It then goes onto the stove to heat up. Ivan's using something simple to ensure his jelly is clear, egg whites. So look, that's perfectly whipped, and we really quickly need to move on and get it into the saucepan. The whipped egg whites act as a filter by attracting particles of spices and crushed beetle. The liquid's then slowly strained through a cloth bag. Thacker cooked for the Dean and Chapter of Durham Cathedral. Religious institutions like Durham were expected to cater for all classes, especially at Christmas. But this wasn't for the poor, and they may have had a lucky escape there. Fancy dishes like oysters and jelly were only for high-status clergymen. And while Ivan's jelly is clearing, he's heading to the garden to prepare his festive but slightly messy shellfish. Our ancestors had a very slippery definition of what they thought were fish. They even included beaver, porpoise, and sometimes barnacle geese on the fish menu for the advent fast. This process is called shucking. It's meant to be the sound as they open. They make this sort of shucking noise. But with these British native ones, I always find it really difficult to do, especially these very big ones. They just don't want to open. <laughs> Come on. I've been there, Ivan, and bought the messy T-shirt. Now, shell wrestling complete. He goes back inside to gently cook the oysters with some mace and peppercorns, by which time the jelly's finished straining. So the jelly has been dripping down and cooling as it drips. And as you can see, the egg white has absolutely cleared it. So here I've got a bowl of ice, and I'm going to ladle in a couple of ladlefuls of the red jelly and I'll start off by putting a layer of oysters and then some more jelly. Finally, the very last ladleful of jelly. So that's Mr Thacker's oyster jelly finished, but before it's served, it really needs to sit for about 24 hours, so I'm going to put it into a really cold place. OK, time's up. So has the jelly set? Hopefully, it will come out. For the final flourish, Mr Thacker tells us to garnish the jelly with fennel. And there's an oyster dish fit for a cathedral Christmas feast. Well, it looks nice enough, but I'll let you do the tasting, Ivan. Here goes. Bon appétit. I'm surprised. It's actually quite delicious. With a nice glass of white wine, that would probably go down pretty well in the deanery at Durham Cathedral. Well, it's no big surprise that oyster jelly has fallen out of fashion. But I can't ever imagine Christmas without chestnuts. They're tasty enough roasted, but I also love them in an amazing dessert from across the channel. It's one of the most festive sweets I've ever tasted.
Now, as Christmas scenes go, you don't get any more Christmassy than the French Alps, that beautiful snow-covered mountains. And this dessert really epitomises that. In fact, it's named after one of those mountains. It's a Gâteau Mont Blanc. Now, at its heart, it's got a combination of three main ingredients. It's got cream, it's got meringue, and it's got chestnuts, which are bang in season at this time of the year, but it's all about the meringue to start off with. Get going by putting six egg whites and 300 grams of caster sugar in a mixing bowl. Then place it over a pan of warm water. Now, there's so many different methods of making a meringue. This is a Swiss meringue, and the technique is to heat the sugar with the egg whites. Don't have it sat in the water, because otherwise it's going to get too hot very quickly and start to cook. Another key to getting this right is to use a really clean and dry whisk and bowl. Grease or water can spoil the meringue. Now, what you end up with is like a royal icing, really, and it's perfect for making a dessert if you want to stick it in the fridge for a couple of days before you serve it. Now, ideally, you wanted to get it to about 60 degrees. You can use a little thermometer. Once it's the right temperature and all the sugar is dissolved, put it onto your mixer. Then whisk it for three to four minutes until smooth and glossy but still warm. You can see it's really firm. It's almost like a cloud. It's fantastic. Spoon the meringue onto a tray lined with silicon paper. Then you need to make a large disc shape with a raised edge. And then all you do is pop that in the oven for about two and a half hours. The oven will need to be preheated to 100 degrees centigrade. And once the meringue comes out, you'll need to let it cool before adding the snowy filling. To turn it into a Mont Blanc, you need cream and a few more ingredients. Now, I'm using double cream for this. And you incorporate that with what's in this tin. Now, this is chestnut puree. They come in sweet and savoury versions. Make sure you get a 250 gram tin of the sweet one for this, or else your dessert will taste like Christmas stuffing. And I like to add this at the beginning, really. So when you whip it up, you get all the flavours of the chestnut in there. And while that's whipping up, you can just grab the seeds of vanilla pod. We only want the seeds for this bit. You can use a bit of vanilla bean paste if you want, but pop that in there as well. Don't need any sugar added into this. You've got enough with a meringue. Don't overdo the cream either. You just want to whisk it to soft peaks. Once you get to that stage, you're ready to create your alpine scene. My best advice with this is, is to stick the meringue onto the dish so it's nice and solid. And then we can basically build it up. So you just take your chestnut and cream and don't do anything with it other than that. And then we can grab some of these. This is really the jewel in the crown at this time of the year, marron glacé. So all it is, really, is a chestnut that's been seeped in stock syrup for several times, then slowly sort of dried out, and you get candied chestnuts, which these are. The idea is you put them all the way around, so when you cut it, each person gets a marron glacé. That's the idea, anyway. The snowy dessert gets a final dusting of grated dark chocolate and seasonal chestnuts. It's kind of one of those desserts that is hugely popular in the Alps and on the continent, but a lot of people have never even heard of it. At first glance, you wouldn't think meringue was a seasonal sort of dish. But don't forget the chestnuts. Full of flavour, simple flavours as well. But the jewel in the crown being these fantastic marron glacé. They are so good, I promise you. It is wonderful. Now, we all know this is supposed to be a season of goodwill, but there's one veg that gets bad-mouthed all year round. Which is a shame, because the Brussels sprout is an essential part of the British Christmas dinner. East Yorkshire farmer Matthew Rawson and his wife Zoe are on a mission to rehabilitate this humble green. And to remind us that it's a veg for all seasons. 
It's a big misconception. A lot of people think that Brussels sprouts are just for Christmas. I grow around about 17 varieties of Brussels sprout, and that's to give me supply from the 1st of September right through until the end of March. We sell about a third of our Brussels sprout from the very beginning of September to the first week in December. We then sell about a third of our crop in December, with the vast majority of that disappearing in the 10 days before Christmas. Nearly two and a half billion sprouts are picked, sold and eaten in the UK during the festive season. That's enough to give one in three people on the planet a sprout for Christmas. Although not all of them would thank you for it. Back in the day, I think sprouts were maybe overcooked, overboiled. A lot of the older varieties were very bitter. But really, we've come away from that. We've got lovely, sweet tasting varieties all year round. And the sprouts on the rise, we're increasing consumption year on year. But let's be honest here consumption might increase even more if sprouts didn't have a certain, you know, reputation. There's a lot said about Brussels sprouts giving people wind. And, yeah, maybe if you've got poor digestion, they maybe do. All brassicas and sprouts have a high glucose inlet content, and that, if you eat too many, you maybe can get a slight wind infection, yeah. A wind infection? Sounds lethal. Fortunately, Matthew has ways of changing the public's perception of his beloved greens. Today, he's invited a group of local school kids to come and learn how the sprout reaches their dinner plate. All right, guys, who wants a sprout? But would there. sprouts appear on their own Christmas wish list? I like sprouts because they're healthy and I just find them tasty. Oh, I just don't really like them. They just feel weird in your mouth when you're, like, eating them. So these are my sprouts. This is as we see them ready for picking. I plant these out in May. And the sprout is really, really clever. If you can see right now, each sprout leaf's got a bit of moisture in it, and each leaf is designed to run water down to the leaf and down to, down to the root, so it just keeps itself watered all the time. Brussels sprouts come from the same brassica family as cabbages, and their name may have been the result of their popularity in the capital of Belgium during the 16th century. It was the Victorians who first introduced them to the UK, and they probably used children to pick them too. Luckily for these kids, Matthew has some modern-day farm tools. Without them, he couldn't cope with a Christmas rush. All right, guys, so what we've got here is a sprout harvesting machine. All that good work that you guys were doing back there on the stalks, this machine does for us. And believe it or not, it actually goes through a vacuum cleaner which sucks up all the debris and the rubbish and nothing but pure sprout like you've got in those trays land in the hopper. But enough of me talking about it, let's see these guys in action. In the lead-up to Christmas, it becomes very manic. We have to run 24-7 for the, the 10 days before Christmas, so that involves working a lot of hours, not sleeping, but we, we have to do it to not let the public down and get their sprout on the Christmas table. It's Matthew's wife, Zoe, who gets the Brussels sprouts ready for their family's Christmas table. And she's got a few tips for cooking them. We don't put a cross in the bottom of the sprouts. Um, Matthew won't let me put a cross in the bottom of the sprouts. If you want your sprouts mushy, then that is the way to go about it. If I'm boiling them, I do boil them, but not very much water, so it's not a full pan, and probably only about three or four minutes. You cook it too long, they have in them sulfites, and that is what makes that horrible sulfury, eggy smell. Um, so basically, you want to avoid that by not cooking them for very long. They tend to go really bright green and that's kind of the best indicator that they're ready. But as Matthew said earlier, a sprout isn't just for Christmas. So Zoe's had to come up with quite a few recipes to keep this veg interesting throughout the winter months. Anna, you were quite good at making the croquettes last week, weren't you? Yeah. I stir-fry them, we have them raw, do coleslaw or salads with them, do a sort of bubble and squeak type thing. If they're cooked properly or eaten fresh or raw, they are a really, really nice vegetable. Her latest creations are Brussels sprout croquettes and a bacon and cranberry sprout salad. But will this be enough to win over a new generation? I think it tastes quite nice, especially with the flavour of the sprouts in with the potato. I think they're very nice with, like, with the sprouts and I think it makes it taste even more nice. Well, I was one of those unusual kids who always really liked sprouts, but with so much fantastic winter produce around, I'd never seen the point of making the same old dinner 
every Christmas. I've been dying to catch up with my mate and gardening buddy, Charlie Dimmock. So I'm delighted she's popping over. Hello. Charlie! Hello, how, are how are you doing, Trey? Are you right? Oh, sorry. Oh, a gift! A little present for you. Thank you very much. A foolproof flowering house pot. Well, I wasn't going to bring you cakes, was I? <laughs> come along, come along. She's going to help me rustle up something festive, seasonal and just a little bit different. Right, welcome to the kitchen. Thank you. Now, simplify, I'm going to do you a, like a chicken casserole. OK, so chuck it in in the oven and that's it. Well, you don't even need nothing for this one. All we need is a pan, really. Okay. Nice and simple. So, first thing I want you to do is grab me the chicken, which is in the bottom of the fridge there. Um, because what we're going to do, rather than just sort of chuck this into one pot, I'm going to chop it up first. Big year for you, though, this year, because you're, you're, you're preparing Christmas lunch, though, yeah? I know. First time since 2009. So, how many people are you catering for? Well, at the moment, it's varying between 8 and 12. What could go wrong? Well, you need to know how many you're cooking for. Could be, that's yeah. the first potential thing. <laughs> okay. If 16 people turn up, you're going to have a problem, no, aren't you? No, well, we'll just have to spread it thinly. <laughs> yeah. This is kind of a dish that you could do for those 8 to 12 people, you see. This recipe serves four, so obviously Charlie will need to multiply it up for a bigger party. The first thing to do is cut your chicken up into eight pieces. Although, of course, you could get your butcher to do it. And something tells me that's the option Charlie would go for. Fantastic. You look like you might have done this before. I've done it a few times, you see. You know, <laughs> a few times. I saw you on TV as well. You're quite accomplished in the kitchen. Master chef and all. <laughs> I wasn't. I was out first round, you <laughs> lying toad. Dare I say, not your domain, is They it? sold it to me as, do you like cooking? I do, but my cooking is music on, glass of wine, poodle around, not... Yeah. Here's a kitchen, there's a box with some ingredients in it, make two dishes, go. Right. I spent about ten minutes looking for the knives. Right, it looks like I'll be doing most of the work in the kitchen today, then. When the chicken's portioned, I season the pieces really well, dust them with a little flour and fry them in butter until they're golden brown on all sides. The reason why we use butter is butter gives it flavour, but also it gives it colour. Okay. So what got you into gardening then in the first place? Yeah, this is going to really surprise you. I was quite a tomboy as a kid. Never. <laughs> yeah, never. <laughs> I was down the garden to help my granddad yeah. in the veggie patch. Which so like... yeah, that's, I just sort of fell into it really. When all the chicken has been sealed, remove the pieces and put them into a casserole dish. Then add one finely chopped onion and a clove of garlic. So if you can get me some Madeira, which is over there. Now, a little tip for you. Always, always buy good Madeira. Because okay. if the food's rubbish, give that to the fox and get <laughs> hammered. And then forget about this, all right? So, a little bit of Madeira in here. A there. little bit? That's like a gallon and a half. No, it's You've not just a gallon been... and a half. It's just a small amount. It's more like 75 mils, actually. I follow it with half a litre of chicken stock and 200 mils of double cream. Always, always double cream. You chefs love to keep the calories up there, don't you? This is actually a low-calorie show. Oh, is it? This whole series is all about... Wow. ..keeping your body in shape. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As I pour in the double cream. Yeah. Mmm. Mm. Look at that. <laughs> so, salt and pepper, and always buy good quality salt. You're going to hate me cos I really don't use much salt at all. No, well, I just want you to taste this. The only time I have a lot of salt is when margarita around the rim. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> See, that's quite pleasant, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's really salty. But it's salt, that's why it's yeah, rigid. It's <laughs> really, really salty. Blimey. Well, she may not share my salt habit, but I know Charlie won't object to fresh herbs. Right, a little bit of fresh thyme. Now, obviously, Christmas busy time for you. You're cooking this year. Are you doing panto again this year or no, not? No, panto this year, so that's why I'm doing it. So I haven't had a Christmas at home since 2009. Because <gasps> so... you've done panto for, what, six, 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 six years? Six years, yeah. What so, is that like? It's good fun. Really? It is good fun, yeah. Because yeah. I keep Love getting asked to do it, but they keep asking me to be some, you know, like fat orange in James and the Giant Peach or something like that. Or... <laughs> well, I've always been very organic. A what? Very organic? organic. <laughs> What's that? What's, yes. what's that? Well, there's many <laughs> right. jokes that okay. can be had at my expense. All right. And, yeah, the, there's some jokes in there that are very clever. All right, so very next time I get clever. asked to do panto, I've got to say do yes. Do it. Just do it one time. You will enjoy it. It's not going to happen. <laughs> I'm definitely sticking to cooking. 
And now leave the pot to simmer for 15 minutes and get on with chopping the mushrooms. So we've got chanterelles, <laughs> a little bit of chestnut mushrooms as well. So seasonal produce now. Obviously, we've got pumpkins, we've got squashes, we've got, you know, mushrooms. What else? What Leeks else? are still going, your cabbages will still be going, Brussels sprouts will still be going. Yeah. So Brussels sprouts, is that going to be on the menu for you this Christmas, then? Yes, because we're very traditional families. So right. Yeah. But so, is, it, yeah. is it quite nice to have sort of Christmas off this year? Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited by it, because I'm going to put some Christmas decorations up, which I haven't done for ages. I have got Christmas decorations that I made as a child. As well. Have you? Yeah, yeah. You've still got all the Christmas decorations you had as a kid. It's a star, it's four pointed star. And it still goes on the tree. It's all right. Not all this posh stuff that you've got. I haven't got posh stuff. Look, this this thing. This is this is this is all you've got to do. Look. If you've got to put the mushrooms in, yeah. gently simmer this for 15 minutes and then leave it. Put it in the fridge, and then when you come to reheating it, put it back on the stove, cook it gently for about 20 minutes, it's done. Whether you cook it and serve it on the same day or prep ahead. I like to throw in a healthy handful of chopped parsley just before serving. You have a taste of this. Go on then. You can tell me what it needs. It needs something. What does it need? Pepper. Yeah, needs something else. You're going to say butter, aren't you? Exactly <laughs> right, Charlie. You're exactly <laughs> right there. It needs a little bit of this to enrich it. Now taste that. Yes, that's very nice. You could get a job doing this. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Charlie. I'll keep that in mind. Now, to go with my lovely seasonal stew, I just need to reheat some mash I made earlier. And if you thought the casserole was rich... Best mashed potato is done with equal quantities of potato, uh -huh. butter and cream. No! Yes, Charlie. It's, it's, an, it's a must. Look at that. <laughs> it's... <laughs> I don't like it when it's like baby's feud, like puree. Could you add a few more lumps to it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking, right, just no. teasing. Now check out this chicken. You ready? Mm -hmm. This is the moment just you take it to the table it. on Christmas Day. Oh, look at that. Oh, smells yummy. I was hoping to have our seasonal supper around the table, but Charlie wants to watch the sunset from the garden. My guess is she's been cooped up doing panto for far too long. This is actually the perfect dish for this time of year, isn't it? Yes. Nice and warming, good flavours. It tastes wintry, doesn't it? It does taste wintry. Mm. I love cooking with fresh produce all year round, but there's something extra special about the seasonal flavours at Christmas time. They're rich, warm, comforting and guaranteed to put you in a festive mood. Unless you're made to eat it in the freezing cold. I never thought a dish would warm up my knees. <laughs> <laughs> well, Charlie, thanks for coming. And uh, I hope Christmas lunch goes pretty well. <laughs> Are you on the end of a phone? Well, if I'm not, you're only 10 miles away, aren't I, really? <laughs> You'll be here banging on the door. <laughs> it's all gone wrong. <laughs> <laughs>